Hello Unity fans! In our last video we created some variety in our characters or meeples, so that all our woodcutters wouldn't look exactly the same. We've also already managed to get the woodcutters to continue chopping down trees until there are none left. But they have not yet actually harvested the wood. It's a real shame that all those resources are going to waste. Today we will combine our existing woodcutters functionality with the structure and objects that form part of our meeples to allow us to visually gather the wood properly. In the previous video we added an empty carrying basket to our woodcutter. It employed a skinned mesh renderer and was connected to a root bone to ensure it moves correctly during animations. But we haven't made its content dynamic yet, and we haven't allowed the woodcutter to put the basket down before chopping. When the basket is on the ground, we don't want the animations to affect it anymore, so we'll actually have a second basket with a normal mesh renderer for this purpose. To keep track of all of this, our unit script needs references to a few extra game objects, namely for the two baskets, as well as the axe and the saw. We will also want to swap the axe and the saw out between his hand and his belt. You could definitely do this by adjusting the position and rotation each time, but while we're still in early development, it's easier to take game objects already in their correct places as parameters. So in our meeple prefab, we make sure the hand and the belt both hold an axe and a saw, and we will just enable and disable the correct ones when the time comes. Finally, we also have a placeholder for a cabin, to which he can return with his full basket. We also have references for the instantiated versions of the basket and the cabin. Finally, we need a list of prefab logs to put inside the baskets. The position and rotation of the basket on his back and the one on the ground is not exactly the same, so you could have one array of resources and adjust the position and rotation differently for the two baskets, but I have again created separate prefabs with the logs already correctly positioned and rotated. These logs will be placed inside the baskets as the wood is harvested. So whenever a unit is created, we also instantiate its cabin. They occupy the same hex, and for the moment you will just walk straight through the cabin as if it doesn't exist. But it gives us a visual placeholder, so we know where the logs need to be carried to. Up until now, the woodcutter has always had his basket on his back, even while chopping. And he is also not yet sawing the wood into logs after felling the tree. So we need a few extra steps to our cycle. We add a step to put down the basket before chopping, and two steps to saw the wood after the tree has fallen and to pick up the full basket again before heading home. Since we're going to have to start swapping tools and baskets, we write a method we'll use to make the correct ones visible at specific times. All it does is hide the one while making the other visible, based on the parameters supplied. It does this for the baskets and the tools, and also hides or shows the resources in the basket. In order to have him put down the basket when he gets to the tree, we need to instantiate the temporary basket. We use the gather animation for visual effect, since he goes down on one knee to perform this task. Then we instantiate the object and rotate it according to the woodcutter's rotation to keep the rotation the same every time. We make the basket on his back visible, but keep the axe in his hand. Then we place the empty basket a specific distance and direction to his left out of the way of where the tree will later fall. We have to make sure what the height of the terrain is at that location, so that the basket isn't stuck into the ground or hovers depending on changing elevation. Finally, we cancel the gather animation and indicate that he is ready for the next order, which is chopping the tree. We've already covered this in a previous video. I made a small change in the way he steps back from the tree when it's falling, by now letting him walk backwards looking at the falling tree, which I feel is more realistic. To get this to work, we add a parameter to our travel method. It contains the functionality to always face the direction of travel, and I merely added an indicator parameter that bypasses this when required. Now, when the tree has been felled, he needs to saw it into logs. We achieve this by calling a method to step back to the fallen tree, 
and call the sawing method when he gets there. Now, not every tree falls in the same way, since slopes can influence the way the tree falls. While you can't easily cater for all eventualities and angles, you can get the woodcutter close to the tree wherever it ends up, rather than walking to a fixed location each time. Our travel method already caters for an offset from the center of the target hex, which allows it to walk up to the tree in the first place. This offset can now be set to the location of the fallen tree. In order to calculate the required location, we need to string three vectors together. The first one is from the center of the hex to the base of the tree. Next, we move partway up the trunk of the tree. And finally, we don't walk all the way to on top of the trunk, but leave a buffer like before to allow space for the saw. Adding these three together gives us the offset our woodcutter needs to aim for. It's not always a perfect fit since we don't allow for variation in the rotation of the woodcutter, but for the more reasonable cases it works well. At least he won't be sawing the log from 10 paces away. To start sawing, we swap tools so that the saw is in his hand and set the animation to saw. Now, as he is sawing, we want the logs to be harvested. Like we did for the chopping animation, we add an event to the sawing animation. Each time the saw is at that specific point, it counts as one, let's call it hit as before. And every four hits gives us a log in the basket, but on the third of the four hits. This is, of course, adjustable to however we'd like it to be. So each four hits we instantiate the next log in the array of log resources and place them in the basket on the ground. When we get close to the last log, we let the tree start dissolving. And when we're done, we cancel the sawing animation and indicate that he is ready for the next order. He now has to pick up the basket. Similar to before, we calculate an offset that takes him close to the basket. Then call a gather animation and swap out the baskets when he is kneeling. We also place the axe back in his hand as the default tool and make the logs on his back visible as well. And now he can walk back to his cabin, where he will drop off the logs. We still have to design exactly how his cabin fits into the map, and we would need to employ the same mechanic as the walls and gates to force him to approach the cabin from a specific side to keep him from walking through walls or fences, but that is a topic for another day. Let's quickly have a look at the kind of thing that sometimes happen unexpectedly while developing the end product. First off, we have the woodcutter on the right here, which is in the middle of his job when he suddenly realizes he's left the stove on. He rushes back at quite a speed, then returns to the tree and continues as if nothing has happened. Next, I made the trees less resource intensive by adding physics to them one by one as they are being chopped, since they only require the physics when they fall. This is what happens when you accidentally switch the physics on and physics off around. Back to the working version. Finally, I've also adjusted the walking speed in cases where a full hex is not covered per step. This is necessary since our original travel method was calibrated to a certain number of seconds per hex, and it did not cater for offsets on the hex. So a short walk on the hex took as much time as a long one on the hex. By getting the ratio of the length of the walk to the length of a full walk, we can adjust the speed at which we pass through the Bezier curve making the walk shorter and faster. So taking off at the start and slowing down at the end isn't excessively slow anymore like before. And with that, we once again can automatically chop down every tree in sight, as long as it can be reached. But at least the cycle is fleshed out properly with additional visual steps, and we can now use the logs for something productive. Please consider subscribing and stay notified if you'd like to see what we tackle next. Goodbye. Thank you.